I'm Ross Adams. I am the co-director of architecture at Bard College in New York State in the United States. Um, and before I start, I wanted to just say a big thank you to everyone at Tbilisi Architecture Biennale of 2020, um, and especially a uh, big thanks to Elena Darjanya for having invited me to give this talk. The title of my talk is Speculative Imperialism in the Age of Natural Violence. Um, so I'll just jump right in. Shortly before his death in 2006, a lengthy essay authored by Reinhard Koselik on the history of the concept of crisis was translated and published in English in the Journal of History of Ideas. Originally an entry in the monumental eight-volume set he helped to edit, Geschichtlich Grundbrief, or Basic Historical Concepts, um, for him, the urgency of writing this piece in 1982 emerged from a deeper cultural skepticism of liberalism and its blurring of the political and existential with the everyday. Crisis for Koselik was, in its changing uses, a crucial conceptual lens through which to chart this change. According to him, the late 20th century had seen the concept develop myriad new sensibilities in its ever-widening use. Koselik saw this as not just a matter of imprecision or intellectual vacuity, but rather as a symptom of a much broader, much deeper historical crisis whose dimensions and contours had yet to be identified. The concept of crisis, which once had the power to pose unavoidable, harsh, and non-negotiable alternatives, he writes, has been transformed to fit the uncertainties of whatever might be favored at a given moment. This signaled a kind of cultural endpoint for him in which the political capacity of crisis had become the object of an increasingly cynical, atomized opportunism. Crisis was, for Koselik, a, quote, structural signature of modernity, as he called it, that had become a whatever signifier. Uh, and in that, his observation constitutes an early sign of an emerging political topography in which crisis had begun to play an increasingly definitive role. The reappearance of the essay in English at the turn of the 21st century, I believe, is significant. Indeed, the ontological and epistemological centrality that today crisis occupies is one of the key features that distinguishes contemporary society from our modern predecessors. Once understood as an ever-present possibility that modern governance, science, and society sought to collectively to prevent through forms of institutional knowledge, expertise and technologies, today crisis has come to occupy not only the center of gravity in the world, exerting itself across all spheres of life, but also presents itself as the very conditions through which uh, life is given visibility. Crisis is both the origin, I argue, and horizon of contemporary knowledge structures. Displaced from the realm of exception, it is simultaneously a determinate factor, form of analysis, and organizing principle of, for contemporary modes of existence. In finance, for example, the shift is marked by the extraction of value from assets through future speculation on what is unknown and contingent. Uh, and in insurance industries, uh, the parallel rise of so-called uh, parametric weather insurance products has emerged, amongst many others, of course. This shift manifests itself, of course, also in the uh, realm of architecture, urban design, and international development. And indeed, this sort of nexus between uh, all three areas is something I'll talk about today. Like with many other practices and discourses, uh, crisis in these fields has been instrumentalized as a productive binary of risk resilience, a kind of epistemological framework that both articulates the problems and casts the outlines for their solutions. Over the last decade, a growing network of spatial practices partnered with global governance bodies, municipal initiatives, NGOs, and large-scale real estate development firms has been building a mode of development around the notion of resilience. Resilience in this context, as it's been described, is the capacity for a city to, quote, survive, adapt, and grow in the face of any major shock. So the, prices, the presence of crisis being... Um, quite obvious there. So what I'm interested in doing in this talk is to examine how crisis has opened these modes of intervention that stretch across scales and that span between the design of spaces and the design of policies, uh, funding schemes, and programs of improvement. 
I want to approach this new formation from two points of departure. On the one hand, as a complex of relations between the design of space and the structures of economic and political power that preside over it. I want to examine how resilience institutes new techniques of governance, in part by reimagining the body. A fair amount to unpack there, which I'll do in a moment, hopefully. On the other hand, I want to understand how resilience as a concept central to emerging practices of international development has taken hold. <clears throat> by looking at both sides of this, I want to expose how resilience operates as a techno-material and epistemological paradigm across multiple fields that pits environmental crisis as an inevitability and thus a universal justification for urban development in the age of climate change. So one of the key players in the emerging field of re resilience urbanism is the multinational firm Arup. <clears throat> Together with the Rockefeller Foundation uh, and building off of a network of related projects, uh, they created what they called the City Resilience Index, or CRI, uh, in 2015. This is a toolkit uh, that they describe as a sort of open platform for self-assessment of cities. Um, its aim, in that sense, is to both measure the degree of vulnerability of a city and to outline a set of possible interventions in order to increase its overall resilience. As a platform, it's meant to be accessible to any city or neighborhood or, or uh, town and to operate also across scales, providing a sort of universally applicable framework for appraising the built environment more generally. Aligning itself with an emerging global governance discourse on resilience, the CRI organizes its metrics in a circular matrix divided into four broad dimensions, as you can see in the gray, the health and well-being, economy and society, urban systems and services, leadership and strategy. These are then further subdivided into 12, as they call them, goals, which you see in yellow, um, which then are further uh, measured, let's say, by 52 indicators, as they call them, that chart out both quant quantitative and qualitative valuations of a given city's resilience. In this model, as they write, as, as uh, one consultant told me, measurement is key. You cannot plan what you cannot measure. As its circular form suggests, in addition to detailing the so-called strengths and weaknesses of a given site, the CRI provides a holistic framework in which certain causal relations across the various indicators can be identified. Because it's universally applicable, its measurements are explicitly relative, based on a generic scale of 1 to 5, where 1 indicates very poor and 5 indicates excellent. Uh, meaning that its output is more of a statement of confidence than any exact value. But precisely because of this, the CRI does more than measure resilience. In operating across multiple temporalities, it works at once as a recursive diagnostic tool and as a framework for development. In other words, both an assessment of the present and a kind of project for the future. Its explicit rejection of absolute standardized metrics emphasizes the relational effects between the various indicators and goals, while also opening itself up to more speculative capacities in evaluating scenarios of urban design and policy reform, and ultimately ways to attract capital. Yet the CRI's relative differences work in the opposite sense as well, making visible sites of vulnerability, which, because of its sort of nested relational structure, immediately present themselves as existential threats for the system as a whole. So where it is weak uh, is indicating a kind of an area that needs to be changed, otherwise the entire system will suffer. Here, the binary of risk and resilience embeds itself in the very logic of the CRI framework universally distributing 52 possible ways in which a city or site would uh, face a kind of existential crisis. As Arab states, urban populations are facing increasing challenges from numerous natural and man-made pressures such as rapid urbanization, climate change, terrorism, and increased risks from natural hazards. Cities must learn, then, how to build resistance in an uncertain world. So you see there's this non-differentiation between all the various types of 
uh, risks and hazards that they list even in this one quote, climate change and terrorism and so forth. The CRI model is built on a previous tool that Arup created in 2000 for measuring sustainability. It's called the Sustainable Project Appraisal Routine, or SPEAR as they call it, um, which is really a simpler tool used to assist in decision making on a range of given projects uh, based on a single array of indicators, as you can see here, organized into four quadrants or areas of concern for sustainable development. So here, again, it's it's much more, let's say, simple tool, but we, we go from economy to society, environment, and natural resources, and these are the main uh, areas of concern for this uh, tool. Like the CRI, the indicators provide a means to assess a given project or site and to establish key interrelations then between them using a similarly relative scale of measurement from so-called worst case to optimum, as you can see in the lower right. As a discursive tool, uh, Spears' broader framework drew its inspiration from the 1987 uh, United Nations World Commission on Environment and Development publication uh, known as Our Common Future, uh, as well as its technical parameters which come uh, in part from UK sustainable development indicators, as well as with the Building Research Establishment Environmental Assessment Method, or BREAM, if, you, if you're aware of that. As with the CRI, the sort of vagueness of Spears measurements is really a function of its use as a speculative tool uh, for scenario planning. Following the 2006 publication of the Stern Review on the Economics of Climate Change, uh, SPEAR really became more explicitly used as a persuasive tool in the office uh, for commercial urban development in Arup's uh, recently opened urban design office um, and its expanding portfolio of so-called eco-cities. As such, the SPEAR model uh, effectively translates the parameters of international development into a tool for the increasing global demand for large-scale real estate development made buoyant by the promises of so-called green capitalism. In, other sense, uh, in, in another sense, commercial design here is emboldened by the language of international humanitarian development. So while both the SPEAR and the CRI are reflexive tools for assessment, a crucial difference between the two is how each locates a particular temporality in relation to uh, the crisis it aims to address. So in the case of the SPEAR model, uh, its role is clearly preventative. It works as a for, sort of framework to improve upon so-called business as usual practices of urban design by demonstrating how ecological footprints and other metrics of a given scenario can be lowered and energy use mitigated. More broadly, it provides its metrics as a response to an indefinite promise of an invisible condition measured in parts per million, a kind of crisis yet to come. Uh, now, of course, it's, it's worth saying that climate change in the early 2000s was not an invisible problem everywhere. Uh, however, in, uh, let's say, London uh, or the UK, where this project was uh, sort of developed, um, there was perhaps less of a, con a direct connection uh, to that. So that's, that's what I'm referring to. Um, the urbanism, nevertheless, that it calls forth continues a sort of uh, techno-modernist cause and effect strategy whose calculated effects have the insidious task of demonstrating the non-arrival of climate change, uh, an urbanism uh, which casts itself not as a template for a radical new future that may be uh, you know, fit for the crisis that, was, that, that is coming, but one which appears instead uh, as a kind of greener version of the present. Sustainable design, while still universally, of course, embraced as a rhetorical touchstone today, somehow lacks the urgency that we see in the resilience turn. So what happened? Well, somewhere in 2005, um, things began to change and the sort of big gamble for staving off climate change with lackluster campaigns of you know, better than business as usual development was somehow confronted with the very visible effects of climate change, and again, visibility uh, within the sort of centers of power in the world. First, let's say with Hurricane Katrina, and then later uh, with Hurricane Sandy, uh, things such as rec record flooding in Europe nearly every year from 2009 onward, 
uh, disappearing polar ice and island nations, record temperature rises, and so on, all set against a tumultuous backdrop of the 2008 debt crisis, the spiraling war on terror and its unending consequences worldwide, uh, the increasingly palpable effects of climate change ushered in a fundamental shift in the understanding of crisis, or at least in the presence of crisis, again, situating itself further and further in the center of, of uh, everyday life uh, for many people around the world. In this space, uh, sustainable development could no longer, uh, uh, as well as green capitalism, and the entire world of sort of neo-Malthusian uh, cybernetics and the so-called limits of, of, to growth that it built its assumptions on, could no longer really enjoy some kind of consensual self-evidence. No longer, in other words, could crisis remain a possibility to be technocratically averted, a sort of known unknown, uh, preventatively excluded from life in the centers of global capitalism. If the present itself seemed to be a state of perpetual eruptions of existential crises, whose character and impact appeared increasingly unpredictable, uh, what was at stake was now survival itself. Design and development could only conform to this condition by taking an aggressively preemptive posture. And this is where we enter sort of the, the world of resilience. So what is resilience? Well, the difference between sustainability and resilient urbanism, let's say, uh, approximates that uh, of the distinction that, that C.S. Holing makes in his seminal essay from 1973, uh, Resilience and Stability of Ecological Systems. Uh, C.S. Holing uh, is a, an ecological scientist. Uh, he's also now an economist uh, that works specifically with resilience development. In any case, in this essay, uh, resilience, he argues, shifts uh, attention from equilibrium to, quote, conditions of persistence. According to Holing, Stability and resilience within an ecological system are not only divergent indicators, but also often contradict one another. A system with the capacity to absorb shock, quickly returning to equilibrium, he, read, he, he discovers, may actually be more susceptible to long-term collapse than one whose population swings violently between near collapse and sudden dominance in the face of a given event. Thus, what resilience measures for him, in other words, is not how quickly a population can return to equilibrium after a shock, but rather uh, the persistence of relationships within a system and the ability of these systems to absorb changes of state variables, driving variables, and parameters, and still persist. Following um, Holling's own application of resilience from ecology to economics, uh, we might say that we might venture a similar metaphorical leap in asking how such a resilient governance might work. If in ecological terms, resilience shifts focus from stability, measured in population count, for example, to stability of relations between population and state variables in the face of a shock, to use his language, then what would it mean for a city governance complex, for example, to be made resilience, resilient? Which factors must adapt for this? Or to paraphrase Michel Foucault, which bodies will such a governance make live and which will it let die? Uh, in a sense, there's an implication here that what's at stake is not you know, the number of people uh, in a city uh, who, are, who are able to sort of withstand a shock, but rather the systems uh, in which people uh, inhabit a, a space. So uh, systems of governance, systems of capital, uh, and so on and so forth. So as David Chandler writes, uh, decision-making and resilient governance does not precede policy implementation, but rather becomes what he says is a continual process of self-reflection upon already existing policy entanglements. No longer something, in a sense, to exclude, crisis or failure, as Chandler argues, is actually incorporated into governmental practices as a means to improve overall knowledge and policy making for the future. In other words, policies are, are meant to sort of open themselves to crisis as a sort of driving factor of how they change and evolve in a way uh, to make themselves better. So they're constantly changing because of the crisis that they sort of allow to, to come in and, and disrupt their systems.
The CRI's emphasis then on, on governance um, crucially diverges then from the SPEAR model in this respect. As a part of its governance mandate, the CRI recommends that cities incorporate what they call comprehensive monitoring, providing continuous data on both the city and any hazards it faces. Indeed, the reflexive nature that the SPEAR model, that in the SPEAR model remained passive, gains agency here in the CRI, offering itself as the framework in which a program of comprehensive monitoring can be organized. In other words, the CRI is itself also a, a means to collect data, sort of in a platform through which one can collect data. In other words, just as the CRI measures data to assess a given city's site, site's resilience, so too can these data points become targeted uh, sites of data collection. Data collection, ubiquitous monitoring, and as it was called in another Rockefeller funded project, uh, situation analysis, as you see in the upper right little bubble there, all constitute a kind of reflective practice of, urban, uh, of resilient urban governance, which ma many resilience projects make explicit. Yet, this is not simply a matter of introducing what's been called algorithmic uh, mode of, modes of governmentality. Indeed, what's at stake is the ability to authoritatively map the fine grain of risk and how an emerging mode of governance can then shore up an emerging mode of large-scale development. Mapping risk has become a crucial component in organizing governance around failure while also offering itself as a sort of ubiquitous precondition for a correlative practice of preemptive urbanism, one which incorporates the experience of disaster and the concreteness of past events into a kind of prescriptive tool to securitize speculative development. And I think here, this is a sort of iconic um, project, the big U by big, uh, so it's a kind of iconic project of Rebuild by Design. Um, it's been an ongoing project in New York City. And I think here you see that uh, this project is, is actually one of the only ones that's really survived. Um, a lot of the other projects have sort of fallen away or been sort of um, tuned down. But this one in particular is uh, the surviving project of that, pro of that meta project. And I think it's interesting because you see exactly what is meant to be preserved here, right? Wall Street, uh, quite, quite literally. So from this, uh, we begin to, well, well let's say the, the, um, the reflective quality of the CRI is precisely its cap capacity uh, to exploit the resilience risk binary, pitting localizable existential crisis as the impetus for urban design while effectively mobilizing disaster risk governance in the service of expanding capitalist development in an uncertain world. So from this, we begin to get a picture of how a kind of planetary crisis, or crises really, yields a planetary paradigm. In the space of resilience, the urban gains visibility through the circulation of data. Data illuminates both the city as a site of insufficiencies and remedies. The circulation of data provides the means by which we're to judge urban space universally, while playing up to each site through its particularities. In an age of climate crisis, the circulation of data forms the core of a knowledge structure that doubles as a system to manage what happens in it. But then, what does it mean then to dwell within a resilient city? So today's new paradigm of urbanism, if we can call it that, um, aimed at addressing a condition of undifferentiated crisis, is conceived as a program uh, of both punctual and large-scale infrastructural design that seeks to reimagine the interface between the urban and human world uh, and the environment, typically the coast. To reduce the risks of living uh, in a changing climate, infrastructure under this regime takes the environment as its object of modification. For such environmental infrastructures to work, they must be coordinated also by vast arrays of ubiquitous sensing technologies and algorithmic modes of knowing. In a sense, it's smart city urbanism reprogrammed for crisis and crisis management. In this move, resilient urbanism expands the quantity and, and, and type of data that it mines to span the interface of human life and the environment. 
uh, attuned to parameters of what is broadly defined as risk. Uh, though we may think of resilience urbanism as a sort of direct response to climate crisis, it is in fact that it names a regime to address risk in general. Again, as a consultant told me uh, from Arup, climate change has a complementary relationship with resilience strategies. Uh, and I quote here, the risks are many and climate change is merely the factor of change that exacerbates all others. So this is why resilience urbanism can address the effects of climate change, uh, like sea level rise, storm surges, and so forth, while also thinking and speaking directly to terrorism without any sort of contradiction. So what fundamentally marks a departure from the history of modern urbanism with the resilience turn, let's say, is the way in which resilient urbanism reimagines the body. And this is what I'd like to argue. In a sense, the environment can only be taken as a site of intervention by, at the same time, suggesting a kind of body ontologically internal to it, a body marked by its malleability and responsiveness to its environment across many scales. It's entangled more than human relation to its environment, as perceived in this way, thus opens the body up, revealing itself as a complex topography of microsites, a sort of ecology of data points and bioindicators that can be precisely measured and in turn taken as a site of urbanization itself. Bodies of resilient urbanism become ecologies of data whose natural uh, rhythms, habits, responses, and desires collectively contribute to a vast new trove of quantified knowledge uh, and the coming codes of algorithmic modes of control. No longer simply the subject of urban design, the body, in a sense, now doubles as its object, as infrastructure, making everyday life indistinguishable from the permanent technological modulation. More and more projects today that address things like risk and uncertainty seem to be concretizing a set of strategies uh, of design that relate global and regional uh, conditions of risk with techniques that then directly operate on or from the body. Uh, we see many projects which enmesh infrastructures and bodies in environments of leisure and care. And in some cases, as this one, there's literally no distinction between bodies and infrastructure, just as there is increasingly less distinction between the everyday uh, and emergency uh, in the broader horizon of resilience, urbanism. In this space, it's the circulation of data that is instituted not to eliminate the possibility of crisis, but precisely to situate crisis as the condition of possibility for resilience. An urbanism that at present seems to be interested in building new knowledge through which to detect anomalous events of human life amidst a generalized state of emergency. With the adoption of smart, ubiquitous sensors, algorithmic administra administration of infrastructure, the circulation that comes to matter is that which maps the contours of a world in which endlessly complex and overlapping systems of social, logistical, climatic, and environmental conditions shape an endlessly unfolding and unknown present. Yet today, just as we remind ourselves that bodies still matter asymmetrically, Right? Just as urban designers begin to recognize the ways in which urbanism has always contained a core of racism, of imperialism, and violence, very often the same liberal designers who seek to confront this history through mild campaigns of inclusive uh, representation are at the same time, nevertheless, designing the disappearance of the body. The body of resilient, in, uh, resilient environmental imaginaries, we could say, dematerializes. Its fleshy presence in space-time becomes only a means for it to transcend into a kind of parallel quantified self, a body in a sense dismembered into an endless record of body effects and through data. In so doing, the most well-intended designers of resilient urbanism very likely enable the same racist imperialist diagrams to inhabit new algorithmic truth structures and disciplinary technologies that have long shaped urbanism, whether resilient or otherwise. The body as infrastructure, as I argue, when collectively conceived, offers a sort of real-time image, perhaps no longer urban in nature, but rather 
environmental. Indeed, the body's becoming infrastructural may be the other side of a process we might call the becoming environmental of the urban. Many of us who uh, live in wealthy cities may not directly notice the resilient turn or perceive the dematerialization of the body that I've just uh, suggested that it brings with it. Indeed, many of us may benefit from this. However, it's worth reflecting on how resilience is operative in other sites and on other bodies um, outside of certain centers of power. As a transdiscursive term that in the age of undifferentiated crisis that we seem to be in, resilience uh, explicitly binds these new techniques of governance with the expansion of capital. And this is important to underline. So to better understand this, we would do well to look at other sites uh, transformed by the very same logics and tools of resilience as cities like San Francisco and New York and others that I've just shown here. So now uh, moving from the world of of urban resilience and resilience urbanism, let's say, I want to look at the relationship between uh, resilience and development or international development, really. So reflecting on rural development programs aligned with resilience in Bangladesh, geographer Kashya Paprachki argues that the very same epistemological structures operative in urban resilience, as we've looked at, um, and often involving the very same foundations and organizations, are transforming international development into a process of displacement and dispossession, as she argues. In what she's called the adaptation regime, crisis empowers an imaginary that specifically negates any futurity in rural and subsistence forms of life that this space has sustained for centuries. Further, in doing so, it associates the inevitability of climate change with that of migration and urbanization, equating progress with the uprooting and forced displacement of rural communities to urban sites. Not only does this justify the displacement and dispossession of rural communities, it measures improvement in seeing members of rural communities becoming workers and urban workers in ecologically disastrous uh, large-scale agro-industrial facilities, uh, such as uh, shrimp farming, as this image shows, um, that are often the product of previous waves of development projects. In her assessment, resilience development in the global south can be seen in the, uh, as the process of dispossessing and enclosing bodies in new relations with global capital, constructing a massive labor force whose prior ties to the land and the practices of subsistence farming are the necessary uh, casualty of climate adaptation. Well, this may be uh, this may seem more brutal than the kind of metrics we've been looking at that assess urban resilience or many of the sort of ubiquitous images of unproblematic improvement uh, that architects uh, often create that accompany them. Uh, it gives pause to recall that the world of international development has deep historical ties and roots in the centuries uh, and systems of European colonialism. Indeed, as none of this None of this should surprise us uh, when we recall that resilience, as it was originally theorized, is not, again, a measure of a population's ability to with, withstand a shock, but rather, again, to quote, the persistence of relationships within a system and the ability of these systems to absorb shock, uh, which, of course, depends on how you might interpret that, uh, fra that phrase. And in this sense, we can perhaps more clearly grasp the disturbing underbelly of resilience urbanism and this sort of climate gentrification that it's already begun to foment. Whether through forms of climate gentrification, as we might call it, or the dispossession and displacement of rural communities, resilience does both material and epistemic work to make claims about the future, foreclosing it to a logic of capitalist-led modes of development, while obscuring uh, the fact that at the same time that the same development will inevitably displace violence uh, of climate crisis to other sites enacted upon other bodies. In other words, resilience may represent a new paradigm of enclosures that exacerbates the existential nature of life already deeply divided across socioeconomic lines. While such divisions may be seen quite easily in the spectacular financial enclaves, like Miami here, of climate security. Uh, and, and if you don't know, in Miami, 
uh, a lot of the wealthier neighborhoods, uh, as this one, uh, they're raising the roads as basically uh, flood protection barriers uh, for real estate. Um, so while such divisions may be seen quite easily in the spectacular financial enclaves of climate security, such as Miami being constructed in the world's economic and political centers, the application of resilience in the spaces of production and extraction reveals resilience to be a disciplinary framework for reorganizing social relations around capital, uh, production, and labor exploitation. Uh, dispossessing and enclosing bodies in new forms of risk that, in the context of architectural scholarship, go largely unaccounted for. So to conclude, uh, through a network of power built on the confluence of private foundations and multinational firms, uh, global governance frameworks, university research laboratories, and other municipal forms of government, uh, resilience has come to identify a new kind of preemptive development paradigm preemptive design, let's say. A renewed urban entrepreneurialism, uh, to quote David Harvey, uh, re uh, recoded with the language of humanitarian aid whose colonial overtones should not go unnoticed. Like sustainability, ecological urbanism, and all green design, we must look to these projects to discover what they refuse to represent. <laughs> namely the sort of neo-Malthusian contours of their outsides and the necropolitics that their elusive enclosures promise as the effects of climate change bear down. What and who are to be saved and what and who are to be left exposed to the extraordinary violence of unprecedented weather. If removed from its capitalist context, resilience may appear as our last well-intended attempt to wrangle with the slow violence of ecological transformation. Uh, preventative measures that speak to the sort of universality of climate change and thus appear as urgent solutions for the collective survival of the human species. However, it's worth recalling that despite the ecological origins, Resilience is a term that has also been central to restructuring economic policies and strategies associated with the contemporary forms of imperialism, particularly in the US. The, the measurement and distribution of vulnerability, for example, a crucial notion animating many resilience frameworks, repeats a pattern found throughout the modern history of imperialism that so often enables a violence of dispossession, uh, and the subsequent imposition of patriarchal modes of sovereign rule. As Judith Butler and, and several others have argued, such a discourse on vulnerability discounts the political agency of those deemed vulnerable, thus inviting instead a, pa a paternalistic relation of care and governance that colonizes any collective imaginary of, other, of alternative uh, futures. The conceit of the human body as infrastructure uprooted from communities of care and enmeshed in an algorithmic form of governance, offers the other side of the same imaginary. It may be possible then that the growing entanglement of municipal and global governance with uh, global urban development, uh, together with the granular remaking of the body, the reimagination in the way of the body, constitutes part of an emerging complex of space and power, a speculative imperialism in the age of natural violence. Thank you for staying with me.